Hello, welcome to Cloud Native Live, where we dive into the code behind Cloud Native. My name is Whitney Lee. I'm the host today. I'm a CNCF ambassador. So every week we bring to you a new set of presenters to showcase how to work with Cloud Native technologies. We'll build things, we'll break things, and we'll answer your questions. So this week we have with us Jim Baguadia and Shu Ting Zhao here to talk with us about what's new in Kyverno 1.13. This is an official live stream of the CNCF and as such, it's subject to the CNCF code of conduct. So please be respectful of the presenters of each other in chat and please be respectful to me too. So friends who are joining us live, Will you please just say hello and say where you're visiting from? I think it's the coolest thing ever that we're all a part of a global community. And um, speaking of, will I see either of you at KubeCon coming up? We yes, I will be at KubeCon. So yeah, looking forward to it. It should be an exciting week. Awesome. I'm going to be there too. I'm so excited to go to Salt Lake City. It'll be the second time. I was there just briefly on tour when I toured in a band. So I get to explore the city proper this time. I'm looking forward to that. So um, right. y'all who are watching, it's not too late to register. So if you want to join us in Salt Lake City, uh, there's the link down there. It's a rather long one. You can Google it, I'm sure, and figure it out. So with that, I'm going to hand it off to Jim and, um, and Shu Ting to introduce themselves. Will you tell us who you are, please? Absolutely. Thank you, Whitney. I'm Jim Baguadia, co-founder, CEO at Nirmata, and also a maintainer of Kiberno. Uh, in fact, Shooting and I were both, um, yeah, some of the original authors of Kiberno, even prior to, you know, what it eventually, as it became part of CNCF, was rebranded to Kiberno. So really excited to be here and to talk about uh, what's in 113 and what's coming beyond. And I'll let Shooting introduce herself. Thank you, Jim, and thanks, Whitney, for inviting us. Hey, everyone, I'm Shuling Zhao. I'm, as Jim introduced, I'm a Caverno maintainer, one of the original author of Caverno, and I'm now trying to help uh, manage Caverno releases, including offices, uh, like the, 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 the designs, the documentations, and simple policies. Amazing, that's so impressive. So, um, shooting. we're going to say goodbye for, to you for now. We'll see from you later. And Jim, I'm going to put your screen on. I lost my interface. There we go. And here you go. Take it away, friend. Sure. Yeah, so before we dive into 113, you know, I wanted to just spend a little bit of time talking about the history of Kiverno, what are some of the basics uh, in Kiverno. And then we'll get into the details itself, right? So, or we'll talk more about the release and some of the new features. So, Kiverno, first off, if you go to our website, kiverno.io, one thing you'll see is that our tagline changed, right? So, uh, most folks who are familiar with Kiverno know us as the Kubernetes native policy engine, is what we used to have. Uh, let me double check and make sure that's what it was. Yeah, if you go back to 112, uh, that's what we used to kind of, you know, advertise in terms of Kiverno. But now if we go to 113, what we see is we have evolved more into being a full-fledged policy as code solution, which works both inside and outside of Kubernetes. So this is something, you know, we had started down this path about, uh, I think about eight months ago and announced this at a prior KubeCon. Uh, had introduced some new projects. And what's really interesting is this evolution, and I'll just use this one slide, which shows a little bit about that journey. So we started with focusing on Kubernetes, which is still you know, where we see primary usage of Kiverno, being you know, building policy as code in a manner which is very intuitive for Kubernetes admins, very simple uh, to use and fits in well with the Kubernetes ecosystem, right? So it doesn't really require a new language. Uh, there's no major learning curve. Policies, policy reports, policy exceptions, all of these can be managed directly through the Kubernetes API. So extremely you know, well integrated into Kubernetes. And also, of course, works great with other tools like Customize, Argo CD, or Flux for GitOps, things to that nature. So 
and out of Kiverno, then as we were designing and building it, the policy reporting API became, you know, something that was one of the things we first split out, right? And the idea was that, well, if Kiverno is using this API, there must be other tools, other solutions that also need a reporting API. So why not, you know, evolve that into a standard API that any tool can leverage? So, and we've seen adoption here from tools like Flux and Trivi and several others who are also now reporting Kubernetes, um, you know, whether it's uh, any any sort of finding, any anything that they want to, you know, um, showcase to admins using the standard structured API, which is a great step forward. And this API is now part of the policy working group, and we are also promoting this or working with various SIGs to try and promote this to a SIG level API. Um, and I, once that happened, also you know within the Kiverno community, we have a policy reporter tool, which can take all of this. And as you see in that little thumbnail screenshot on the top right, it's showing reports from both you know Kubebench as well as Kiverno. And, and same thing if you're running you know other scanners like Falco, those reports can also now show up over here, right? So very cool uh, to kind of see that evolution. But then, you know, as we were working with various platform teams, the natural question that would always come up is, hey, we love Kiverno for Kubernetes, uh, you know, uh, it works great, but we also want to apply policies to things like Terraform or to Docker files or to other artifacts, maybe in my CI CD pipeline. And, you know, maybe there's a need for runtime policies in other systems. So why can't Kiverno handle that? And that what led us to Kiverno JSON, which we released, you know, a few. Again, it was like maybe with starting with 111 or so, we Kiverno JSON was introduced. But we started that as a separate sub project because we wanted to, you know, incubate it, see it evolve, and then you know start pulling in uh, portions of that into the core of Kiverno itself. Uh, which is happening, which, you know, shooting we'll talk about a little bit in 113, and then we'll see more in the upcoming releases. Uh, and I have a, a quick question from chat that yeah. I think is a great question and also probably one you've heard a lot. How does Kyverno compare with OPA, with Open Policy? Yeah, uh, yeah, that's a very valid and, you know, a good question and something that we think about quite often, right? So... Um, first off, like I mentioned, the idea behind Kiverno was we're all learning Kubernetes, right? And I think the last stat I saw was there's almost like five to six million folks, who, uh, developers who have some sort of, you know, Kubernetes uh, certification. And this is if you see a global, you know, developer population of, let's say, 28 to 30 million, pretty significant, right? So, um, it, so the idea is if you're learning Kubernetes, why do you need to learn some other way of doing things? Kubernetes has a very good um, resource management model. Why not use that for policy and policy as code? And that was the initial intent uh, or idea behind Kiverno, which really resonated with the community and with adopters. And then, you know, as you know, and policy is not just about policy enforcement, because now we also have constructs like validating admission policy in Kubernetes, which Kiverno fully you know, supports, as well as you know, adds a lot of features around. Um, but the idea was to then, you know, for whether it's for reporting, like we're showing over here, or it's for exception management, or other you know, policy as code management, why not also leverage Kubernetes as that underlying engine? So that's where Kiverno starts to, you know, differentiate from something like OPA. And then the second aspect of it, Kiverno from the very beginning has been a full operations oriented system. It's not just for enforcing and blocking things, but it can also mutate and generate right from the beginning. And it's very powerful. Like you can do, do things like you can mutate existing resources uh, you can generate, you know, brand new resources based on various triggers. You can even clean up or delete resources, right? So OPA doesn't do any of those. It's more focused on the validation part 
or the enforcement part only. So that's what really distinguishes Kiverno. And you put all of these together, you get some very interesting use cases. Uh, like there was a blog post from Adidas a few weeks ago uh, where they're integrating VPA with Kiverno and they saved about 50% costs on their dev test systems. Things like that, which you know typically um, you would think, well, I need to build my own controller. Kiverno is great at replacing those with you know policy as code type of um, an approach uh, to those solutions. OPA has a tool, OPA Gatekeeper, to help bring help you use OPA with Kubernetes resources. But with OPA Gatekeeper and with all of OPA, you use Rego to write your policy. And with Kiverno, you use a Kiverno JSON query language, yes, which is meant to look and feel like YAML and be more intuitive for people who who have heavy Kubernetes use. Right. Yes, so the underlying language is, you know, uses James Path, and now it's also evolving towards more cell usage, and cell being the common expressions language which Kubernetes uses mm -hmm. in many places. Uh, so Kiverno is, and we'll mention that and uh, talk a little bit about what's coming in 1.14 towards the end. So awesome. we're evolving more in that direction as well. Yeah, but one just one final thing to add on this journey. Um, there's another tool which evolved as soon as we had Kiverno JSON, um, we, and this was a pain point we saw in the Kiverno project itself, because uh, as the project grew, we have this need to do end-to-end -end tests for it. And there were no good tools out there for declarative, you know, testing and to build a, a you know, good suite of test cases uh, you know, using kind clusters and other, other things in our CI pipelines. So Charlotte, well, one of our maintainers, uh, he created Kiverno Chainsaw, which is based on Kiverno JSON. And that's become a fairly popular project now adopted by several other controllers, other projects within the CNCF community uh, for declarative end-to-end -end testing. So pretty interesting. So check out, you know, I just wanted to give a quick uh, you know, overview of that journey uh, and show mm -hmm. you know, how Kiverno has been going before we dive into some of the 1.13 use cases. Um, so for those folks who are new to Kiverno, the only other thing I want to kind of show before I hand off to shooting is going to talk about 1.13 is a little bit about how you can, how easy it is to get started, right? So Kiverno works as an admission controller. That's its primary form factor. It also has a CLI. It also has now other, you know, integrated as a Golang library or uh, integrated, you know, even uh, as a standalone server, right? So all of that is possible. But by out of the box in Kubernetes, when you install Kiverno, what you're going to get is, uh, you know, the admission controller. So I'm going to actually switch and show uh, I have a kind cluster up and I don't have Kiverno installed. So just to install Kiverno, uh, what I'm going to do is, well, run Helm install, which is one of the form factors we support. Um, and as you see, it kind of pulled up Kiverno. It showed me the version. And then I'm just going to show you the components here in the Kiverno namespace, right? So if I do get uh, deploy, um, what I'll see over here is there's an admission controller, which is listening to requests coming in. Um, there's a background controller, a cleanup controller, and a reporting controller, right? So Kiverno, in, with the 110 release, we have modularized into these. All of these can be turned on and off. Uh, and each one you know, has a well-defined role, um, as well as other things. Uh, you can configure on them in terms of the functionality you want. But once this is done, at this point, there's really no policies. So if I do, you know, um, you know I get CPOL, which is CPOL is short for cluster policy. I don't have any policies on my system, right? But just with, you know, if I do run this command and what this is doing over here is I'm running, um, I'm going to the Kiverno policy repo and we have a number of pod security policies and I'm going to apply them into my cluster, right? So actually, um, you know, before I do that, what I'll do is if I do um, a kubectl, let's say run nginx, uh, let's try 
this and I'll do a dry run of a image, what will happen is it's going to allow me to run this. And this is an insecure pod, you know, because I don't have uh, it hardened for other things, right? So now if I do customize and apply these policies, uh, what I'm expecting to see is, you know, these policies get pulled. Um, and if I just do kubectl again, the get cpol again, let me clear and So now I see I have a number of different policies all around pod security. And if I try to run that command again, let's just try, if we do nginx with dry run server, I'm expecting, oh, these were pulled in audit mode. So that's why it seems like the policies were allowed. Uh, but otherwise, if they're in enforce mode, what I would see is this pod would be blocked right away, right? So let's take a quick look and see um what's going on with these or whether yes everything's up let's try that one more time and this time i'm running them in enforce mode okay so we see that they're already and if I do a dry run, so we're running that, and now they're blocked, right? So this is Kiverno policies, you know, inspected the config and said, hey, you're running a pod which is allowed to elevate privileges. Uh, you want to turn that off. You don't want to run as root. So all the best practices, uh, there's about 17 checks that pod security policies do. So that's just a very basic demo of how you can go from like zero uh, security to fairly well-defined pod security in a couple of minutes in your cluster. And of course, you can automate all of this through Argo CD uh, or through other means, right? So let me pause there on the intro and uh, I'll hand off to Shooting, who will you know talk a little bit about 113 and then we'll do some more demos on specific features for 113. We have a, qu a couple of questions in chat that are general questions. So I thought maybe now that would be a good time to ask them. One is um, about Kyverno in CICD. Can we I, integrate it into CICD? And can you explain some use cases around it? Great question, right? So um, yes, uh, you can. And Kyverno, like I mentioned, has a CLI, which is really easy to integrate into CI/CD pipelines, you can you know um, inspect manifest on PRs. You can then also you know block your pipeline if something is non-compliant, uh, which gives you that early feedback loop. Um, Kiverno, because again everything is declarative YAMLs, you can also build you know higher level tools fairly easily and integrate into that. With Kiverno JSON, we're seeing use cases where not only for Kubernetes manifest. But you can start now, you know, auditing things like Terraform or with, you know, Docker files. And there are, if you're on the Kiverno JSON website, there's some example for this, right? So if I go back to the docs and let's pull up Kiverno JSON. Let me we'll... share your screen again. Yes, please. I'll just show a quick example of, uh, you know, what a Terraform policy would look like. So you're like, say, um, you know, if you have a Terraform payload and you want to validate that, what you would do is you would convert, you know, just using the Terraform commands, you can, in your CI pipeline, you can get a JSON version of that. And then this would be a policy, a Kiverno JSON policy, which is checking uh, for S3 and making sure that they're on an S3 bucket, that there's certain tags defined, right? So things like that now you can start doing because uh, Kiverno supports more than just Kubernetes, uh, makes it fairly powerful and you know almost universal in where you can apply it. It's also nice to figure out whether resources comply with policy before, tr like trying to, the moment you're trying to apply them to the cluster. Like Absolutely. you want to find out as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. Yes, and for I mean it doesn't 
I mean, you would you still want to do admission controls, right, for defense and depth and all of that good stuff. Oh, yeah. so you want to mm -hmm. make sure each layer is being checked. Um, and the interesting thing is your Terraform plan. So let's say your plan is actually spinning up the infrastructure or the cluster itself. There are things you can enforce at that level. Then once the cluster is up, you have admission controls running in there. And of course, Kiverna is also doing background scans as things are changing or periodic scans for audit and compliance. So uh, the very you know cool thing is you can now have the same policy that applies in all three phases, which where previously you had to use point product or did like different tools um, in different places, right? So this allows you to use one format, one policy across all of this. Um, we answered this before, but a quick recap. Um, how does how does a Kyverno compare to OPA Gatekeeper? So Gatekeeper is also an admission controller, right? But mm -hmm. um, it, uh, you know, and it itself is evolving beyond uh, OPA or like Rego to some degree. Um, so Kyverno has all of the features that, again, Gatekeeper would offer in terms of admission controls, but it does more in terms that it can also mutate, generate, clean up resources, which you know OPA or Gatekeeper do not allow. Um, and then, of course, you know just the, whether you use Rego or uh, I believe Gatekeeper is also now evolving to support other formats of policies. Oh, but interesting. Um, that's something on their roadmap. Uh, so as of course Kubernetes evolves, all you know, Kubernetes related projects will also uh, continue to expand and evolve. Um, how does Kyverno relate to GitOps? So the, with, so first of all, if you believe in policy as code, you want to, you know, apply the whole policy and the GitOps lifecycle to your policy artifacts as well. So policy should be stored in Git. And like I showed in this command over here, uh, when, if you recall, when we pulled these policies, um, I ran that command and I pulled them from a Git repo. So now you could, uh, I did this just with customize and kubectl, but this could be a Git controller pulling policies. So anytime you submit a change, that's automatically distributed into your clusters. So applying the same, you know, the reason why we love GitOps is because of its flexibility and usability. Uh, and the power it has, there's no reason why you shouldn't be using that for policies as well. But then, you know, Kiverno also works really well with both Flux as well as Argo CD to enforce checks early. So, for example, Kiverno reports, if you're using Argo CD and you go to the UI, Kiverno reports show up right for every resource right there because they're Kubernetes artifacts, right? So it, that's another sort of uh, value that you get. Uh, from just using standard APIs and standard tooling. So it integrates very well into get the whole lifecycle for both manifests, as well as using that same lifecycle for policy as code. Amazing. We have a couple more general questions, but would you like to maybe save those for the end so you can talk more yes. about the new release? Okay. I think, uh, yeah, let's do that. Let's switch to shooting and what she has to demo. Amazing. Let's do it. Jim, would you like to stay on the screen or shall I put you backstage? Um, either way. Um, okay, let's leave you with us. Come hang I out, friends. <laughs> Shooting, take it away, please. Thank you, Whitney. I, I love this session because it's really interactive and, um, you know, answering those questions would also help us clarify uh, how Kimberna works and uh, with other integrations. So, um, you know, now I'm going to dive into the release one. Dot one three uh, for Kiberno, we just announced the release um, this morning, and we'll be diving into the you know major features for this release. We'll do live demos later in this session. But uh, first of all, of all, let me go through some of the key features that we want to highlight and will be include in this um, session. So there, there will be a six door bundle verification that is offered by Kiberno. This is through the Kiverno verify image verification policy that now you are able to verify container images uh, signatures that use the six door bundle format. And then um, in the 113 release, we have enriched 
um, support of policy exceptions of the validating emission policy integration. As Jim mentioned, um, there's cell expression used in validating emission policy, which you know is a built-in solution in Kubernetes to do the emission enforce. And um, in this 113 release, we are able to leverage Kubernetes policy exception to auto-generate the validating emission policies so that you have more granular exclusions for your resources and workloads. And one of the other um, major feature that I wanna highlight is, is the generic for each. Let me quickly, yeah. So the generic for each is the most requested feature that we've seen from the community. Um, the goal is to generate multiple resources um, upon the trigger actions. So here, the common use cases we've seen is that, you know, you're taking a list of namespaces and you want to add a network policy into those namespaces to allow traffic to the newly created namespace, right? So we're going to have a detailed demo in the session later, but this is one of the features that I want to highlight and I love most, so I pick it up um, for the demonstration later. And yeah, so there's also other enriched uh, reporting strategy in Caverno. Um, so we have enabled the custom data in the policy report. As you can see from here in the cluster policy, you are able to add additional report properties into your final report by adding this field into the cluster policy. And in the final policy report or the cluster policy report, you'll see those two added properties in your um, reports. And we also enabled the reporting for mutate and generate, including the mutate it's existing policies in this 1.13 release. So previously we only have the reporting for validation policy as well as image verification policy. And now you are able to see the audit events for the mutate policy application as well as the generation. So yeah, I believe um, Whitney will share this blog post, uh, the link to this blog post. And mm -hmm. now I'm going to, thank you. I'm going to switch to my terminal. Let me know if you cannot see that. And we'll see the very first demo for the generate for each feature. So as I explained earlier, the goal of the generate for each is to create multiple resources for a list of items, right? So given this new namespaces that I'm going to create into my cluster, as you can see here, I have the annotation uh, with the key allowed namespaces and I have comma separate, comma separate string defined here. Those are the names for the namespaces that I wanna generate the network policy into. So the use case here is that, so by default you have network policies to deny all traffic into, uh, in, those existing namespaces. And whenever you uh, there's an, an in-common new namespace, you wanna allow the traffic between the old namespaces and this newly created na namespace. So here um, I have a generate policy is for each declaration I'm listing through the annotation from the namespace and I'm trying to parse that comma separate string and then for each namespace, I'm going to create a network policy, which allows the ingress traffic and the egress traffic using the namespace selector that matches this label, right? So the element James path variable that you see here is the built-in variable that is parsed from this list item. So in this case, we have Alice, Bob, and Carol. Then um, the element, in this namespace will be uh, those three defined values. Okay, let me switch to my terminal and I have set up a test um, environment. So I have a Kubernetes cluster with those four namespaces: Alice, Bob, Cara, Carol, and Dave. And I wanna create the network policy for the first three namespaces, but not Dave. And in this case, um, I have the allowed namespaces defined in the annotation of the common namespace. So let's first try and create the policy. One, one, 
add allowed network policy. So let's track the policy is in ready status. Okay, now it's ready. And then I'm gonna go ahead and create the namespace to trigger that um, generate policy. So ideally I would say, I would see three new network policies created into um, each namespace respectively. And before that I have the default network policy set up for um, those namespaces I mentioned, which is to deny all traffic. So let's go ahead and create the trigger namespace. To Kubcato create dash f with the namespace YAML. So the shooting namespace has been created. And now let's check the network policy again. Let me just do that once again. You'll see there are three new network policies generated into Alice, Bob, and Carol namespace and not Dave. And here, if you inspect one of the network policy, Let's do network Paul and Alice. Give it a name. And then dash of YAML. So we have the namespace, namespace selector with this label matching the newly created namespace. In this case, um, the new create the newly created network policy overrides the existing deny all, and then it allows traffic between the namespace shooting and Alice. So yeah, that's that's the first demo I have. Uh, this is the generate for each. We have um, added the, the 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 this change in one thirteen, and then we'll be adding the you know data list and clone list in the future releases of uh, Kubernetes one fourteen to allow generating or cloning a list of resources um, using the the generate type of policy. Okay. So back to the next feature that I want to showcase, um, which is re uh, related to the reporting. So we have, you know, as I mentioned, we enabled the reports for mutate and generate. And now you're also able to see warnings um, along with your admission response. So what I mean is that um, you see when there's an incoming request that violates the existing policy, there will be an violation generated um, into the final pulse reports, right? If you have the policy set to enforce, then um, the request would be blocked, as Jim dem demonstrated earlier. Um, in this case, we have added this warning for policy violations, as well as mutation events. Um, what, by, what that means is that you are able to visualize the policy violation along with the with the emission response, that's when you create the resource. And then you are able to do the dry run and decide, you know, if there's any violations, I don't wanna go ahead and create the resource. I maybe I'm gonna fix the violation and then reapply the resource. So again, um, to demonstrate this feature, I have a simple validate policy, which is a pod security type of policy to enforce the restricted pod security standards. Um, with the latest version, and here I have failure action set to audit. So when I create a new pod, so here I'm matching the pod. So when I create the new pod, I would expect that the pol policy violations um, will be returned to my terminal when I create the like the kubectl create pod command, right? So let's let's create the policy first. Let's do kubectl create. And again, you want to inspect the policy is ready. This is the enforced pod security. It's now ready. And let's do a dry run to create an Nginx pod. So I'm doing kubectl run Nginx with the Nginx image. And here I'm doing a dry run, the server side dry run. So yeah, here you go. You are seeing a warning saying that, OK, can run a policy. Enforce pub security is blocking your incoming requests, and these are all the failures that you need to fix. And um, but in this case, since we have the failure action as audit, you are still able to create the pod. But you know those are the warnings, the violations that you need to pay attention to, and eventually fix in your um, incoming request. And the same thing happens with the mutation. So if you have a simple mutate policy that adds a label to the namespace, you'll see the same 
um, warning message saying that your namespace has been altered. In this way, a new label is added, and then there will be a report, policy report generated um, for that mutation events as well. Okay, let me just pause here and see if I have questions. If not, um, then I'll hand over to Jim. There, there is a question, and it has to do with um, how does Kyverno policy relate to network policies? So the question itself is, is it possible to enforce network policies de defined through Kyverno with CNI plugins? Well, it's it's very different type of policy. So Kubernetes network policy is trying to restrict or allow traffic between namespaces of the workloads. But with Kyverno policies, um, like in, in Kubernetes cluster, you are able to enforce um, any of the incoming conf resource configurations, or you can do mutations or the generations, as I showcased earlier, um, you know, for some automations, right? So those are very two different topics. And speaking of, I think you wanna, you mentioned something about uh, CNI plugins. Oh, yeah, I think I think it's just a confusion. So a network policy is an object that's a native Kubernetes object. It's, it's not related to Kyverno policy in any way. And a network policy, um, if you create a network policy, it's not, um, nothing happens unless you have an implementation, a, a controller implementation, which is usually part of your CNI, right. which stands for Container Network Interface. So all of that, although uh, Xu Ting used net, a network policy object as an example for her demo, it's actually a completely different topic, the network policy itself um, from Kyverno. Right. Yeah. Yeah, there is. there are some ways to use them together. And uh, in fact, at KubeCon, um, I have a session with Rachel um, Wanakat, who is the platform lead at Fidelity UK. And we're going to talk about multi-tenancy and micro-segmentation, where we'll, you know, showcase how Kiverno can work with Cilium, which is a CNI, uh, to implement some of this, right? So Fun. Uh, the idea would be that Kiverno policies can generate network policies and can also put some guardrails around network policies. So yeah, there's some interesting tie-ins, but they're completely different, like both of you uh, rightly said, yeah. That's cool. Um, how does Kyverno, what's the fundamental difference between using taints and tolerations to control which nodes things would go on to versus using Kyverno policies to manage workloads? Well, you're able to add or patch those taints or tolerations to your workloads via Kyverno policies, but Kyverno doesn't directly manage your workloads using those tents. It's just an, you know, uh, in the meter or two that you can mutate or um, modify your incoming configurations to, um, you know, further manage the workload scheduling. That's a great answer. And then what are strategies for managing and synchronizing Kyverno policies across multiple Kubernetes clusters? So I think previously we talked Can about we GitOps. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so GitOps would be certainly a great way of doing that. Or of course, if you're using other management tools, um, Kiverno policies, again, are like just, you know, they are a, a Kubernetes resource. It's just YAML files. So you can manage them through any other control plane or management plane that you have uh, on top of Kubernetes. Um, yeah, which makes it easy to, again, roll out your policies as new clusters are coming up or being, you know, provisioned. Excellent. And one more question right now. And that is, how often is Kyverno updated to maintain compatibility with the latest Kubernetes versions? Is it challenging to use Kyverno with cutting edge Kubernetes versions? So we're always trying to keep up to date um, to integrate with latest Kubernetes versions. And now uh, the latest Kyverno 1.13 supports Kubernetes 
31. And um, for ADCH um, release of Kubernetes, where we actually, we currently don't have anything, but I would say that if you're not directly leveraging some of the built-in Kubernetes functions, for example, the pod security, um, you know, one of the policy that I demonstrated earlier because Kubernetes leveraged the Kubernetes library internally, and that could, you know, bring some changes in the edge version. And if you don't you use those kind of features, then there will be no impact. But be careful if you're if you're if you do have you know policies using the pod security emission or the validating information policy that we have mentioned multiple times, then it could be impacted and you know per the Kubernetes changes. Awesome. Thank you. We re we've got we've answered all the questions now. Cool. Awesome. All right. So the next thing we wanted to show is another new feature that came out in 113, which uh, Shooting mentioned, you know, this uh, support for a six door uh, bundle in, in terms of image signing, right? So this is um, pretty exciting because what it does is it helps simplify integration into other higher level tools. Like I'll showcase this with GitHub and what GitHub does um, for signing as well as verification. So just a quick, you know, review. Like uh, so, Kiburn already had support for verifying image signatures uh, as well as attestations for both Sixdoor as well as Notary. These are two different projects. Uh, they have slightly different signature formats and some other, you know, kind of. Um, different tooling around them. Sixdoor has this way of doing um, what they call keyless signing, which is pretty cool. And we'll actually see that in the demo and how it gets used. But the idea is, you know, in your CI pipelines, you're signing images, you're creating uh, provenance data. So provenance data, uh, I guess it's a fancy term for, you know, just creating metadata for where things came from. Uh, so for example, capturing like the workflow ID or capturing the GitHub repo ID or other information that you want to later verify uh, in your policies. And then you are signing the, that provenance data or other metadata, like you can even sign an SBOM, you can sign a you know, containers image scan, you could do all of the, create those things, artifacts, sign them and then attach them to your OCI image as attestations. So the value now is later when you want to run an image, a policy engine like Kiverno can check for these things and say, hey, did this come from some known, you know, uh, GitHub repo or where did, you know, who built this, who signed this, and should I allow this image to, it to be run in my cluster? All of these questions can be answered, right? So that's how Kiverno, like when you look at the structure of the verify image in a policy, you have either attesters, which are like signature authorities or attestations. And attestations can have, you know, other attesters or and conditions in them, uh, which kind of all ties together to say, okay, if I want to check an S bomb, but maybe I want to block, a, you know, like, Java 8 packages, I can now start doing things like that using my policies and just using policy enforcement. So what, you know, now in 113, that was extended to integrate with this new signing bundle, which is just a different format, uh, which is starting to get used by tools like in, like in this case with GitHub. Um, so that's what I want to demo and I'll switch to a different repo where we have a signing demo for this and show what this actually looks like when we go into some of the workflows and, and details, right? So starting with the actual workflow itself, and this is, you know, hopefully this is visible or I can make my screen slightly bigger. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so just. You know, what I like about this is how simple it, it has become now because, um, you know, so previously if you had to sign an image, you first of all need to figure out how do I manage certificates or keys 
and how do I do this at scale, right? So with this integration, and, and there's a feature, uh, you know, and this is available, different tools have different ways of doing this. But here, as you see in this GitHub action, all we're doing is we're using a build provenance action, which is creating provenance data, and then it's automatically getting signed and pushed. So literally this is the workflow and you could do this at your org level and validate and make sure that all your images now have this kind of signing workflow uh, as part of what they do, right? Now going back, so that's the signing part. And then what we'll see is when you wanna verify this, you can now do things like, and this is a Kiverno policy, which we are looking at, um, where I'm in my, in this case for the demo, we're saying for all images, or you could have specific images. I wanna make sure that, you know, there's an attestation which has SALSA and SALSA is a open SSF standard. Uh, it stands for, you know, supply chain or um, software artifact levels for supply chain. Uh, and it has uh, some, you know, pieces of content. So there's various levels of SALSA. So you can have level one, level two, level three, and they get increasingly in a more, in some ways difficult, but also, you know, stringent in terms of their requirements. So here we are, you know, creating provenance data from a salsa generator, uh, which is collecting metadata information for, you know, that image. And then it's, you know, checking and seeing, was this signed by GitHub? So this is the GitHub signature uh, authority. And is the subject the actual workflow that I care about? Now you could wildcard this, you could have you know, different uh, subjects, or you could have a common workflow within your org or you know, uh, um, your enterprise, which will be used to sign all of these workflows. Um, in this case, it's using you know, um, a, a public transparency log as another additional check. This is optional, you can turn it off or you could even use a private log. And then just for demonstration purposes, we're checking other things here within this policy itself, right? So again, the idea is you, you create this work, uh, your GitHub action to sign things, and then you use policies like this Kiberno policy to verify various pieces of metadata that you care about and that are, you know, if you wanna be Salsa level three compliant, uh, there's various checks you will want to do uh, to make sure that now you have the right data and the right type of image before you allow it to run in your environment. So that's how this works together. And I'll showcase this. I'll, I'll, we'll take a quick look at this in action. But I just want to go back also, look at, you know, if you kind of go, what's interesting, I'll pick one of these uh, action runs from before. And if we dive in here, if you look at the output of this attest step, it's showing me that it's, you know, it's using this thing. It, it actually created a transparency log entry here. And if I look at it, I can go to record, which is the transparency log, and I see a bunch of data again from my signing event. So what happens underneath the covers is cosign creates temporary certificates, signs this, and throws this away, but now when I want to enforce my image, um, I can, you know, it will check with this to make sure that this image was compliant, right? So here, if I do, let's say get pods, I'm not seeing anything. If I do get CPOL, I should have one policy I just configured, which is the policy I showed. And now if I do, you know, let's say kubectl, uh, let's run again that, you know, just uh, some arbitrary image here I'm picking Nginx. And if I do dry run server, what I should see is that policy checks and says, hey, I, I'm missing the attestation that this came from, you know, the repository and the registry that I care about. Now, if I run, you know, let's say um, this image, which was properly signed, I should be able to now uh, allow that image and it gets created, right? You can also see if I look look at the GitHub CLI because we are using GitHub here um, and I'm checking for the verification, if they have a nice you know, way of showing that I do see this predicate type as an attestation. 
and I'm seeing that this was created by this particular workflow. So it's pretty cool how you can now tie all of this back together. You really get the origins of an image, where it was built. You can see who built it. You can attach other metadata to this, including like if you want to, you know, kind of have like, was this uh, done on the main branch? Was this done through a push or some other trigger that you had in your CI? So a lot of these things can be now checked, um, you know, uh, pretty in an easy manner through your policies itself. So if we go back here and take a look at this policy, your, you know, some samples of things you could check, and this is extensible, right? So you, and you can of course have other things too, like what we're doing in this conditions block down here is we're checking whether the build type um it is actually a github workflow and we're also checking the repo again you know uh, which is a bit redundant but for the demo itself wanted to just show how you could do these various types of checks on your metadata that's coming based on that provenance action itself awesome I know that's quite a lot of, of things packed in there, but you know we're seeing more and more folks, of course, this image signing verification is becoming fairly important to do. And in fact, it's become in some ways a mandate uh, like in, in the DOD and in the public sector, um, yeah. there's a push to require this for, you know, um, uh, along with SBOMs and other supply chain security artifacts. That's great. Uh, we have a couple more general questions. Would you like to answer those now, or or do you have some more? Uh, sure. No, let's um, let's answer those, and then we'll switch back. So I think shooting will then wrap up. Uh, you know, for and uh, talk a little bit about one fourteen and what's coming next. Oh, exciting! That's awesome. So we have a lot of questions today from uh, Vijay. Thank you so much for asking so many questions. So um, Vijay's asking, these, both of these questions have to do with pod-to-pod -pod communication. So this one, pod-to-pod uh, -pod policy enforcement, and so does um, Kyverno gearing up for a sidecar. So I'm going to say, Kyverno, so Service Mesh already does this. Service Mesh um, secures pod-to-pod -pod communication, so Kyverno doesn't need to do that. But what are some examples of cluster level policies and cluster level objects that that Kyverno does take care of? So there's several, right? So if you go to yeah. our latest <laughs> policy repo, uh, there's about yeah, 400 plus sample policies. Yeah. Um, so certainly worth taking a look at. Uh, so starting with the basics of pod security, like we showcased a few times, so anytime you're running something, Kubernetes is insecure by default. If you run a pod and don't take care of things like, you know, running as non-root, uh, et cetera, the, you're kind of exposing your workloads and your clusters to container breakouts potentially, right? Um, you also want to make sure you have proper segmentation bounds degrees like namespaces. You want to enforce RBAC best practices. So the list is, and anytime you install something on Kubernetes, uh, like Istio has something like a few hundred best practices that they publish. Um, how do you codify those? How do you enforce those, right? So all of those are examples of cluster level policies. I would you know, highly encourage going through some of the examples here, starting with simple things like pod security and RBAC, but then looking at more advanced policies. So that's wonderful. That's exactly what I was hoping for. So let's get to shooting and hear about what's coming next for 1.14. Sure. Um, so I think we've mentioned cell expressions uh, a few times in Caverno, mm -hmm. um, including the supporting of the validating emission policies um, natively by defining a Caverno validate.cell subrule. And we're trying to you know, integrate the cell expressions as much as we can. So in the future, we may have the cell support in the Kiverno policy language, maybe. And then, um, as you know, um, VAPS, validating emission policy, has become GA in Kubernetes 1.30. 
And they're planning to add the mutation ability using the cell expressions okay. as well. So the beta version is planned for Kubernetes 1.32. So we're trying to um, integrate that um, once it's available in Kubernetes and adopt that as much as we can um, natively in, in Kubernetes. And that will be one of the focus in Bunk 14. So we'll fully adopt all the VAPs and the maps um, in the upcoming Kubernetes release. Cool. Jim, would you like to add anything? Yeah, no, just that also some of these things like you mentioned with the generate policies, et cetera, we're always interested in more feedback, more use cases, because they are you know, extremely powerful, but um, there's other things like shooting you mentioned, like the clone list, et cetera, which are also um, items we want to address. So uh, take a look at you know some of the capabilities and definitely would love to hear how folks are using them and what else we can do to further enhance. Um, yeah, that, yeah, you go. Sorry, definitely we would love to hear more use cases that if you find that Caverno cannot support anything, just you know, reach out to us and we'll, uh, we'd love to help and add the support in. And as Caverno community is very active, we receive lots of questions, um, user requests in our community every day. So feel free to join our Slack channels, interacting with us via GitHub or any format, and we'd love to see you in our community. So the best way to get to you is to join a Slack channel. If you have, if people have questions and they're watching the stream, how, where do, what do they do next? So we have uh, Caverno channels on the Kubernetes workspace as well as CNCF workspace. And we host two public meetings weekly, one for um, maintenance meeting and another for contributors meeting to discuss, uh, this is an open meeting, a public meeting. So uh, we'll be planning Kubernetes releases using those meetings and um, the contributors will join and you know ask questions and we can help uh, with the contribution questions as well. So the meetings, if you're, you wanna chat live or you can uh, go to the Slack channel and post your question there. Perfect. Thank you so much, y'all. This has been so much fun. Thanks for the demos and your hard work. I appreciate you. So, thank you. KubeCon's coming up. I look forward to seeing folks at KubeCon. I always have stickers with me. So, if you see me around, ask me for a sticker. I would love to give you one. And thanks so much for joining today's episode of Cloud Native Live. It's great to have Jim and Shooting here with us, teaching us about what's new in Kyverno 1.13. I also loved all the great interaction from the audience and all your wonderful questions. So thank you for that. And here at Cloud Native Live, we bring you the latest in Cloud Native code on Tuesdays and Wednesdays at this time. So thanks so much for joining today and we'll see you next time. And thanks to those who watched the recording. Bye, thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.